Take your Bibles, if you would, please turn to Matthew chapter 18 as we continue our series on forgiveness, pursuing restoration through forgiveness. We're looking at two objections today. What if they won't repent is the title, Matthew chapter 18. And as you turn there, I'd like to tell you a story. There once were two men. Both were seriously ill in the same room of a great hospital. It was quite a small room. It had one window looking out on the world. One of the men, as part of his treatment, was allowed to set up in the bed for an hour in the afternoon, something to do with draining the fluid from his lungs. His bed was the one that was right next to the window. But the other man had to spend all his time flat on his back, not able to see out the window. Every afternoon when the man next to the window was propped up for his hour, he would pass that time by describing what he could see outside. The window apparently overlooked a park where there was a lake. There were ducks and swans in the lake, and children came to throw the bread and sail model boats. Young lovers walked hand in hand beneath the trees, and there were flowers and stretches of grass, along with games of softball. And at the back, behind the fringe of the trees, was a fine view of the city skyline. The man on his back would listen to the other man describe all this, enjoying every minute. He heard how a child nearly fell into the lake and how beautiful girls were in their, how beautiful the girls were in their summer dresses. His friend's descriptions eventually made him feel like he could almost see what was happening outside. Then one fine afternoon, the thought struck him. Why should the man next to the window have all the pleasure of seeing what was going on? Why shouldn't he get a chance to sit by the window? He felt ashamed, but the more he tried not to think like that, the worse he wanted a change. He began to become offended by the man and what he did. He would do anything to be able to sit and look outside that window. One night as he stared at the ceiling... The other man suddenly woke up, coughing and choking, his hands groping for the button that would bring the nurse running. But the man watched without moving. Even when the sound of the breathing stopped, in the morning the nurse found the other man dead and quietly took his body away. As soon as it seemed decent, the man asked if he could be switched to the bed next to the window. So they moved him, tucked him in, made him quite comfortable. The minute they left, he propped himself up on one elbow, painfully and laboriously, and looked out the window to see a brick wall. This man had been describing things that he could not see, but trying to make life easier would describe things as he would like them to see. However, in his bedmate, the one who was silent and allowed this man to die, bitterness, resentment, jealousy, envy led him to devalue others and to trespass against him by not offering help. Now, over the last five weeks, we have considered the command, the importance, and the necessity of pursuing restoration through forgiveness. This is important. It is something as we as Christians must do. It is a mark of a true, genuine Christian. As Christians, we are called to offer forgiveness graciously, willingly, and freely, as we've seen, to those who repent of their trespasses against us, as God the Father has forgiven us. Pursuing restoration includes repentance and reconciliation, and finally, recreation so that we may live peaceably and in harmony with one another as the Bible has called us to do. Now, last week we contemplated the first objection of forgiveness, of pursuing restoration through forgiveness. And that was from the perspective of the one who has been offended, the one who has been trespassed against, the one who has been harmed. And we considered their struggle, which is, I just can't forgive. I try, I want to, I desire, but there's just something. I just can't get over it. We learned as you look on the monitor here that that comes from a weak heart, 
that reflects a lack of ability to obey God's command. That is someone who has little faith, someone who doesn't trust God enough to take that step forward. It is a weak heart. Reflects a lack of ability, of faith, to trust, to obey God's command. But we also examine then the one, the offended, the one who declares, I will not forgive. Remember, we looked at that with, with the prodigal son, or the, the bitter son of uh, brother for the prodigal son in Jonah. I will not forgive. I refuse to forgive. You don't understand what they did to me, how much they've harmed me, and they refuse to forgive. Going back, we saw that this comes from a hardened heart that reflects a conscious choice to ignore God's commands. And I didn't put it up here this week. I wish I would have. I just remembered it. Is we saw that someone who will not forgive is really someone who says, I'd just rather go to hell than to forgive someone. For that is the command and necessity of a Christian. You must forgive as the Father has forgiven you. And if you do not forgive, the Father will not forgive you. That's part of what we read earlier in our scripture reading of the unforgiving steward. Today we're going to examine now the second part, the offender, the perspective of the offender, the one who says, I will not repent. As we mentioned throughout this series, forgiveness is conditioned on the repentance of those who have trespassed against us. So we're going to see what do we do when someone says, I will not repent. I do not accept your offer of forgiveness. I did no wrong. I did not do anything worth asking for forgiveness. With that, we're in Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to start here in verse 21 to 22. It's a passage we've seen several times, but again, it's worth coming back to. When Peter comes up and says to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? It's a good question. Jesus tell him, you need to forgive. And, and Peter says, well, how often should I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but what? Seventy-seven times. That's right. That's right. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would have such joy in that, that we would see that we are to forgive as you have forgiven us. Father, as we say this, we know that this is not easy. It is difficult. It is challenging. Sin resides in our hearts. We, we, we pick up offense easily. And Father, for those that many times when we do offend, our, our pride keeps us from asking for forgiveness. So Father, I pray that you be with our minds and hearts as you speak to both the offender and the offended. So Lord, so that we may have harmony, that we may have unity and dwell in that unity that you've called us to, not only in our relationships here at the church, but also in our relationships in our marriages, Father, in our, our families, and then extended, even when it comes to the work, to our neighborhood. Lord, that we may lead others to Christ. We praise in Christ's name. Amen. Now, we reviewed this verse, as I said, several times in this series on forgiveness. We do so because we need to be reminded that forgiveness is a command. It is not a suggestion. Peter now here, as you look at this, he's trying to limit his obligation to forgive. Pastor MacArthur notes that the rabbis would cite that the, cite uh, some verses from Amos that taught that God would forgive Israel's armies three times and then he would destroy them. So the rabbis taught that all you had to do was you were obligated to forgive someone three times and after that, boom, bam, destroy them. So Peter here is actually being kind of generous. He's, he's opening up, well, I'll do it more than three times, Lord. I'll do it seven times, thinking that he's going to get an attaboy from Jesus. However, Jesus, as he often does, quickly abuses him of that notion by giving him a number that represents not 490 times where you and I are clicking through, but a, a number that represents indefinitely. You and I are to forgive indefinitely. We are to offer forgiveness, as I've said before, willingly, graciously, and freely. Now let me add one more. Generously. Generously. It is something that we continually are to offer up. Once again, we're indebted to the hard work of Pastor Chris Braun, who gives us a great definition 
of forgiveness. And I wanted to remind us, it's been, a, it's been several weeks since we went through this. But you know what? I'm going to ask you to read this out loud with me. Would you read, read that for me? And if you need to, take your phone out, take a picture of it so you can have it. Or if you, if you know how to write notes real quick, you can do that. But would you read this out loud with me? Ready? Forgiveness is a commitment by the offended to pardon graciously the repentant from moral liability and to be reconciled to that person although not all consequences are necessarily eliminated. You and I need to hold on to that biblical thing of definition, for we saw weeks ago, and you can go back to our messages on YouTube, our Facebook, so on and forth, and you can see that how that differs from a secular view of forgiveness. Now, we see examples of this uh, in the life of both Jesus and Stephen, the first martyr. In Luke, we see, and when they came to the place that was called the skull, there they crucified Jesus. And the criminals on his right hand and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even in the midst of his suffering, of his torture, Jesus forgave them. Stephen, as they were picking up the rocks and getting ready to stone him, to, to kill him by throwing stones at him, says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And throughout this series, I have shared with you real life stories, not that those are not real life, they are, but other modern uh, real life stories of men who have forgiven those that offended, including those that have been tried, that have been uh, tried for murder, those who, who, were, tr- who were murder victims or uh, manslaughter victims. However, as all of us are aware, not everyone is going to accept our offer for forgiveness. In other words, there are going to be here Christians here, professing Christians, whose heart is going to be tender and say, you know what, I want to restore that relationship. So I am going to offer forgiveness to them. But as you go to do so, they, they don't respond. Their hearts are hardened. They now pick up the offense and say, now you're offending me by telling me I did something wrong. Some will discount, uh, discount, disdain, dismiss, or even deny any type of accountability for their actions, for their attitudes, and the harm done towards you and maybe others. They will refuse to repent. I don't have anything to be sorry for. When this happens, you and I can be at a loss for how to respond. I mean, the first point of restoration is repent. If you don't repent, you can't get into reconciliation. If you can't get into reconciliation, you can't get into into the recreation that we'll look at next week. And if you can't do that, there is no full restoration. There is no dwelling in unity. There is no restoration. So what do you do? Step one doesn't even happen. We desire restoration. We desire reconciliation. Yet their reluctance or refusal to repent will continue to harm the relationship and prevent harmony. Now, you and I have all had times in which someone has offended us, someone has trespassed against us, and we just try to put it under the bridge, right? Just water under the bridge. We just kind of just, we'll just overlook it. But yet we know that eventually those things continue to rise up. The water just rises. And eventually it will come to harm, either overtly or just subconsciously. As we look at people and and things that we think of them starts to affect how we treat them, how we live with them. Fortunately, you and I are not left to our own devices, nor to the world's philosophy. As we saw in our Friday night study, it's just vain philosophy. There's no power in it. But you and I have scripture to inform us how you and I are to proceed in restoring our our relationships. So in Matthew 18, we're going to be there quite a bit this morning. Jesus shares the loving devotion and care of the great shepherd for his flock. Look with me at verse 12 as we're going to be going back and forth in Matthew 18. Jesus says to his disciples, what do you think? If a man has 100 sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? What's the answer to that question? It's rhetorical. Of course, yes. Thank you, Lando. Yes, of course he does. And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that, he ne- that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that any one of these little ones should perish. Now, I want you to think, because this seems like an odd intro into what we're talking about in forgiveness. 
But in this parable, Jesus is teaching his disciples that you and I are to treasure every brother and sister in Christ. Now, I want to add also, not only in Christ, but you and I ought to value and treasure every person. For all of us are made in the image of God. No one, as we come back, is to be left wandering or unattended. We are to bring them in. I love that old hymn, bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. We need to keep in mind that when someone harms us or sins against us, it is actually a sin, not only against us, but the real sin is against a holy God. Do you understand that? All trespasses against God. When your little children disobey you, that disobedience is really a rebellion against a holy God, whether they're able to understand it or not. Just as when you and I are struggling with our spouses or with our partners or at work, we're actually sinning against a holy God. We must understand that. We need to keep the right perspective about sin our moral failure to conform to God's law and our actions and our attitudes and our nature. Sin is more than just a bad habit. I saw this the last two days. I have a friend that's in the addiction ministry and they have changed everything to be stubborn habits, bad hangups, or just mistakes. And I just want to scream, we cannot call it, we must call it what it is. Sin, temper, anger, Malice, bitterness, lying, those are all sins. They're not stubborn habits. They're just not just hang-ups that you have or a little bit of problem that you're struggling with. It is rebellion against the very person of God. The Bible tells us that as Christians, we are to kill sin. We're not to make friends with it, tolerate, affirm it, or ignore it. Again, we are to be killing sin or sin will what? be killing us. Yes. Too often we allow ourselves and others, many times those that we love, to diminish the effects of sin in our lives. That is why James 5, 19 through 20, I believe it's here, says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back as the shepherd who is bringing back the unattended, the wandering, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's why we pursue restoration. Because those that have trespassed against us are offenders, rebellious against God whether they profess Christ or not, and we want to bring them back because it's not just sin. It's not just offense. It's not just something against you, but it puts their very soul in danger of hellfire. I don't think we believe that as much as we should. We haven't internalized what sin really is. This is what Jesus has commanded us to do in this parable of the lost sheep. Go out and find them, rescue them, restore them to the fold. Now you may ask how this relates to forgiveness. Those who refuse to repent. It's a good question and one that Jesus understands as he continues in Matthew 18 to teach us what to do when professing Christians trespass, offend against us. So here's the remedy for restoration. It's going to begin in verse 15. So I think you're going to go back here and over, continue on. First, Jesus tells them to approach the offender, to approach that offender personally and privately. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him, what? Alone, privately, personally. If he listens to you, you have what? You have gained a brother. You have restored a relationship. You have, you have, you have canceled that record of debt. None of us, though, like confrontation, though there might be few of you here that do. However, it's important to confront our offender. In Proverbs chapter 27, 5 through 6, we read this. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a, fan, of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. If we can hold that up there for a moment. I want you to consider that passage. 
when a friend, when someone you love, someone cares for you, and they share with you, listen, you offended me this way, or what you said, or how you said it, the way you rolled your eyes, that really hurt me. How do you respond? How dare you? What are you saying? Just get over it. What's wrong with you? Don't take it so personally. You're a crybaby. All sorts of other types of terms you might say. But what we find here is that a true friend is going to be one who is going to confront you and your sin. And you and I need to receive it as kisses, as honey, as a good thing. Now that goes against the grain, doesn't it? None of us like that type of thing. We don't like to confront someone, nor do we like to be confronted. However, Scripture tells us that better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of the enemy. As difficult as this may seem, it's incumbent upon us to pray for the courage and the boldness to confront sin in those we love, those that we know. Christian love does not tolerate, it does not affirm or prove of sin. It must be confronted. So step one is privately, personally approach that person. Share with them your concerns. Share what they may not be seeing. Many times they may not understand what they've done. Secondly, as we go into verse 16, Jesus informs us what to do when that person, when you go to them personally and privately, do not respond positively. He says, but if he does not listen, <coughs> take one or two others with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So now Jesus is bringing in the Old Testament where he said, let everything be established by two or three witnesses. Now what we're doing is we're almost now collecting, as we say, some forensic stuff. Here's how you offended me. Here's the evidences. Jesus tells him now to bring others to help the offender see the necessity of acknowledging their sin. It is not to browbeat them, to gang up on them, but to help them to see the importance, the severity of the issue. They should be wise, though, speaking of these people that may go with you, they should be wise and discerning friends who understand the issue. King Solomon writes this, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. So the one that you're trying to approach, you're praying that they're going to be wise. But also, Proverbs 18, 17 says this. <clears throat> the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examine him. So in this case, your friends may also serve as a sounding board to make sure that your perspective as the offended, the one who has trespassed, is actually correct. Because there are many times you will share your case and someone believes you, but then good friends will say, uh, wait a second. How did this start? Don't we always do that? The kid comes crying to you, right? The child comes crying to you. What happened? Well, he hit me. But if a discerning parent is going to go back and say, well, why? What's going on here? There's more to the story. And so we need to understand these things are just like they're volleys against each other. Just everyone going. And you always know it, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the one who hits second that always gets caught. The first one doesn't. So in this, we see that we're praying for both the offender and the offended, that we may have wise counsel. So it's important for us. Biblically, it tells us that we are to bring counsel to help us to diffuse these situations, to understand the importance of it. Again, the point is not to gang up on someone or to coerce them into repentance, but to gain a brother. Remember that. It's to gain a brother. It's to get something back that has been broken. That's why we call it restoration. The prayer is that by listening to others, the offender and the offendee, I should say, may see the reality of the problem. Thirdly, Jesus states that if they still refuse, you are to take it to the next level. In verse 17, we see that he who refuses to listen to him, tell it to the church. Now, this is an, an odd one. We say, what? Yes. You tell it to the church. In other words, this person now has refused the private and personal uh, exhortation. 
They refuse to listen to others who have heard the situation and said, yeah, you need to repent. You need to ask for forgiveness. And in this third one, you bring it to the church. Now, this seems odd. This is, this is very countercultural. However, I'll tell you, I was at a, a church uh, in, in Rockford, and I once found the notes of the church. And this church started in 1938. And it was amazing as I was reading through the papers how many letters the church had sent to people saying, uh, you haven't attended church in a while. Uh, you haven't been giving. You, you, your, 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 your husband said this. Your wife says this. Let me tell you, the church also is the place that you are to go. I neglected to put this in my sermon, but I'm just bringing it up once again in my mind here, is that the Bible says if there is a problem between people, don't go outside the church, but bring it inside. The Bible says one day that we, the church, will judge, Jane, uh, judge, judge angels. How can we then not judge each other? So I am saying that if you as a wife, if you as a husband, if you as a parent have gone through these things with your children, whatever, your, your, your spouse, and they refuse to listen to you, they refuse to listen to others, then bring it to the elders. It's to bring it to the church. Why? Because it makes it very serious what's going on. The sin cannot be in the body of Christ. Now, this is not very popular. It is starting to rise again. Churches uh, stopped doing that years and years, decades ago. However, we need to see that we live as a community, not as individuals. You and I understand how our families can be torn apart by families and people who, who are like the Hatfield and McCoys. There's an offense here, there's a trespass there, and then everyone starts uh, taking sides. What happens, that family then is torn apart. How can we dwell in unity if that's happening here, if our marriages are falling apart, if relationships are struggling? It may even be at work. You may say, I just need to come and tell somebody. Randy, Lane, and I are here to help to give you a sermon, to help you to understand which way to go. Now, we're to be patient with this. This is not something we just do offhand, but it is something that we need to do. At one time, I didn't tell Don I was going to say this, but one time we were going to a new church, and, and I was not doing what I was supposed to do in helping get the house ready for sale. We were trying to sell our house, and uh, the next thing I know, I get a call from the pastor that I hadn't even started working yet. He goes, Rob, I hear you're not holding up your end. You're right, I haven't been. It was the best thing she did for me. She showed that she loved me. Why? Because I was not listening to her. I remember once when I was a young man, and uh, yeah, I, read, I was probably 13. You know that age when you're giving your mom a hard time? And we had a pastor, and you know, this, this man was, you know, this guy, you know, you thought he was the greatest. And one time we were going walking out, and he says, hey, Robbie, they, they called me Robbie back then. Uh, seems like you're not treating your mother very well. <laughs> Boy, my, Boom. I remember going home, did you tell him something? I didn't have a repentant heart. But she goes, no. What was the problem? She could see, or the pastor could see in our interactions. And he knew it was time to bring it up. And we need to be a church like that. It is difficult to do that. But I know that as difficult as it is, that's what the discipline, the discipline of the Lord may seem harsh, James tells us. But in the end, it's about restoration. It's about winning a brother or sister back to Christ. But fourthly, as we go on, he says, if he refuses to listen then to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Pastor John MacArthur writes, the matter is to be reported to the whole assembly so that all may lovingly pursue the sinning brother's reconciliation. It is not a punishment. It is not a judgment. It is to love that person. But failing that, step four means that the offender must be excommunicated. Discipline regarded by the church as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, this idea, he writes, is not merely to punish the offender or to shun them, but to remove them as a detrimental influence from the fellowship of the church and to regard them as an evangelistic, evangelistic prospect rather than a brother. In other words, we're saying your attitudes, your actions 
do not confirm you as a Christian. And we ask you repent and turn and trust in Christ. That's what it means to covenant together as a body of Christians. When you become a member here, we as a church, we are confirming that profession, that confession of faith. We're doing life together. I know sometimes we can cringe at that, that phrase, but it's understanding that we're trying to affirm and lift one another up. And when we don't measure up to what Christ has called us to, that's when we're to challenge, to rebuke, and to lift one another up. Ultimately, the sin for which he has communicated is hard-heartedness. And you and I need to help them understand that. This is a hard step. One that should not be taken lightly, but one that should not be ignored. It too is a command of Christ. Again, the reason is to offend or to win the offender, not to punish them. By following these steps, we are saying that your eternal soul is more important than any false sense of peace and serenity and security in our relationship. And see, so many times we just do that. Let's just keep the peace. And so people think, well, look at that marriage. Look at that relationship. Look at that family. But we don't understand that there's turmoil in there. And then we're all of a sudden, we're surprised to find out that they're getting divorced. We're surprised that, that, they're, that the things are just uh, topsy-turvy. And many times, by the time that comes to the surface, there is no chance of restoration or it becomes so much harder to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. On a side note, all I want to ask is, how do we know that Humpty Dumpty was an egg? I never see that other than the books. He's never described as an egg. All right, so let's go on. But that's important for us. Not that Humpty Dumpty was or wasn't an egg, but it's important for us to understand that we're about gaining brothers and sisters. I don't want to see anyone that I know that I care for enter into a Christless eternity. And nor should you. So you and I are to respond or to confront sin. If we're the one who is struggling to repent, we must understand that as difficult as this is, this person loves us, cares for us. Now this passage is typically about church discipline among those who profess Christ and are covenant members of the same church. But what do we do if that person who offended us belongs to another church? They may be a Christian, but but they belong to another church, so I can't bring them to my church. Or what if that person isn't even saved? They're not even following Christ. They don't proclaim Christ. I'm going to answer that the principle remains the same. And I want to give you three words. Go, bring, tell. Go to them. Confront their sin. If they don't listen, bring friends with you that maybe know both of you that can hear the story. And if not, then tell those that are necessary to tell. It might be a family. It might be an issue that it's at work and you may need to bring in the boss or the managers. It may be different things. And if you're having a struggle knowing who to bring or how to then bring that to a, an end, then, then ask the elders and we'll, we'll, we'll pray and, and seek reconciliation as much as we can through that. But this principle applies whether it's in the church or outside because our desire is to share Christ. As a reminder, we are called to repent, not only to forgive, But there may be some of you here this morning that you have refused to repent for an offense. Maybe for years, decades. And it's created such an undercurrent of turmoil turmoil, that it's just eroding the foundations of your relationships. But you're also to repent. Josiah Shute reminds us, seen here on here, that that true repentance is when a man or woman grieves for his sin to the extent that he abandons it. Make sure you write that down. It means that we abandon it. We do not continue. We do not repent and then continue on doing the same type of trespasses that got us here in the first place. However, you and I also must be careful in expecting perfection from those who do offend us. 
Many times we are too harsh ourselves and now all of a sudden the script has been flipped and we are the offender. Wretched Network tweeted out this week, I believe I might have it on here. He says, repentance is not about perfection. Repentance is about heading in a new direction. And so to help us understand this, he says, while you will commit sins as a Christian, you will not sin with joy. And I, I pray that that's your heart, that when sin does come, you fall to temptation, that you're not finding joy in it. You happily give up your sins out of gratitude for the one who died in payment for your sins. So you and I must be careful not to expect perfection when someone does, con- does repent, but yet they turn around and do the same thing again. If that happens, what are you and I to do? Just as Jesus says, offer forgiveness willingly, graciously, freely, and generously, without limit. But that's how God has forgiven us. Now, some may complain <clears throat> that those who insist on repentance for restoration, are guilty of imposing unreasonable restrictions, unnecessary boundaries, and seeking dominance. To require, to to say someone must repent from their sin, that just seems too much. Just, Just let it go. Forgive and forget. That's not the biblical standard of forgiveness. In some cases, they may be right. But we understand as Christians that God the Father only forgives those who repent. We are to forgive as God the Father through Christ has forgiven us. He warns in Psalm 7, you'll see here about those who won't repent. He says, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. Now, now think of this. Now, this is a Lord of the Rings type thing. Just picture, imagine wetting his sword is, is, is sharpening the blade, is preparing it. He says he has wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. That's why we want our friends, our family, the ones we love and care for, and even our enemies to repent. For that's what awaits them. Let me ask you, has someone offended you so much, trespassed against you so much, that you want them to be enemies of God? To the point that God will slay them with his spiritual sword, so to speak? Would you rather people go to hell than for you to confront them and care for them? Just ask him. That's between you and the Holy Spirit because only the Holy Spirit knows in your heart. Can you be a Chris Carrier and forgive the man who kidnapped you, beat you, stabbed you, and shot you in the head? For the man whose son was killed while delivering pizzas, could you forgive the family? Be honest, I've shared with you, I don't know. Yeah, I, I trust that God would give me the strength to do so. But if not, I need to see that. And can I be the man who would repent when people come and say, Rob, you've done this, you've done that. And believe me, I'm sure there are. And that's why I say, come to me, please. I never want anything to be between me and anyone else that might prevent them from coming to Christ or listening to the words from scripture. And speaking of the end of this age, when God begins to judge the wicked on the earth during the tribulation, we see in Revelation chapter 9, it says, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, God is once again going to bring plagues on men to, to bring them to repentance. He's wetting his sword, so to speak. But it says, of those men, they did not repent of their works of the hands, nor did they give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. They did not repent. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, there is a story that gives us a biblical biblical example of confrontation and repentance. If you want to, you can real quickly turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 
It's the story of David, Nabal, and Abigail. David is running from this time from King Saul. And by the way, just a quick advertisement. Uh, after Easter, starting in, so what's, what's, that's April, starting in April, the first week of April, we're going to be studying through the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be doing something a little bit different. And so we'll go through this story in more detail. But David is running from King Saul, who wants to kill him because he knows David is a man of God, and he is going to be the next king. But in 1 Samuel chapter 25, the narrative revolves around around David's encounter with a wealthy man named Nabal and his wife Abigail. David and his men, who were on the run from King Saul, had requested some provisions from Nabal as a gesture of goodwill, considering they had previously protected his sheep and flocks. In other words, hey, could you give our men some food? We can't go to the store. No, there's no smart and final. There's, there's no McDonald's out there where he's running from. He says, can you help us? We've been protecting your shepherds and flocks from thieves and from other uh, bad guys. Would you be willing just to give us some bread and some water? Nabal, though, said, no, forget it. There's no way I'm giving you anything. However, he responded with arrogance, refused to help David, and angered by Nabal's Nabal's ingratitude, David intended to retaliate by attacking Nabal and his household. So David is the offended. Hey, I've done you a good deed. Can you not give me? And Nabal says, no way. So David says, okay, he goes back to his army. He's wetting his sword. He's bending his bow, he, uh, bow. He's getting ready his, his arrows, and we're going to attack him. This guy is done. He's done us wrong. Abigail, though, Nabal's wise and discerning wife, intervened when she heard the story, what happened, by taking a generous provision of da- uh, to David and pleading for forgiveness on behalf of her foolish husband. How many times has a wife had to do that? Probably many. She acknowledged David's righteousness and reminded him of God's protection over his life. David was moved by Abigail's humility and wisdom and praised her from preventing him from committing a grave mistake. He repented and relented of his plan. He accepted her gifts and spared Nabal and his household from destruction. So good story. David's offended. I'm going to seek revenge. His wife says, no, please. Would you forgive us? It makes the, here, could you take these, please? Thank you for all you've done. David repents and relents. But when Abigail returned home, as you continue in that story, she found her husband feasting and drunk, unaware of the danger he narrowly escaped from. In the morning, she informed him of her actions, causing him to suffer a stroke. I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at that. Suffering a stroke and to die shortly. David, upon hearing of the man's death, acknowledged God's justice and provision. And then he sent for Abigail to become his wife, recognizing her as a woman of virtue and wisdom. You see, David was offended by Nabal's refusal of provision, and he reacted with a desire for revenge. Abigail quickly approached David to quell his anger and rescue her husband for sure death. In the end, Yahweh administered justice himself. David's heart was moved by a request for forgiveness, while Nabal's heart was hardened and refused to forgive and repent. Or just refused to repent. Let us not be Nabal's. Take your Bibles, turn to Romans 12. I want to apply this for you. I want to give you a few steps real quickly. Three steps how you and I then can deal with this issue. Romans 12, in his book, Unpacking Forgiveness, Pastor Chris Braun gives us three ways that you and I may respond from Romans chapter 12 if someone does not repent, or how you and I can respond to someone who has offended us. First, we're going to see that we are to resolve not to take revenge. Look at verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in sight of all. In other words, revenge means to retaliate in kind or degree or to inflict injury in return. This is what David was going to do. But he says here we're not to do that. Now, when it says repay repay no one evil for evil, that can be from active malice, as David was about to do, or just giving someone a cold shoulder. We're not to take revenge. Instead, he commands us in verse 18, 
If possible, so as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. God knows that we may not be able to do it with everyone, but as much as with your heart, your faith, live peaceably with all men and women. This should be our desire and focus. I think life would be much easier if you and I were more inclined to let offenses and trespasses pass over us. Not that we ignore them, but many times you and I just get offended so easily. It's not just the words someone may say. It may not be their actions, but we're looking at their body language. Did they just roll their eyes? Did they just sigh? They didn't say hi to me. They didn't shake my hand. We're just so easy to pick up. We're like looking around. I remember the, uh, maybe uh, some of you that are older, Randy, uh, Mike, uh, Rick, you might remember the old uh, Robert Conrad. Remember him? Robert Conrad from uh, West Wing. He was kind of a man's man. And he used to have this uh, commercial. I don't remember what the battery was, but he'd put it on there and he'd say, go ahead, knock that off, knock that, knock that off. You know, that kind of knock that chip off. They're just looking for someone to start something so they can pick it off. You and I would do much better if we would take the heart uh, to advice or take to heart the advice found in Proverbs 19 where it says, good sense makes one slow to anger and its glory is to overlook an offense. However, if the offense is truly sinful and puts the offender's soul in jeopardy, then you and I need to act in love. So that's the difference. Are they actively sinning or is it just an oversight? Is it something that they may not even be aware of? But it is truly sin. We must do it. Paul encourages, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. Ephesians says, speak the truth in love. That's how you and I respond, not in anger, not in vengeance. Now, again, this is counterculture to our world today. Some examples of unbiblical attitudes are found in slogans like, get mad, and then get even. Or revenge is excellent self-therapy. Or always aim your revenge where it hurts the most. Go for the juggler. So you and I first are resolved not to take revenge. Secondly, you and I are to proactively show love. Look at verse 20 of, of Romans 12. On the contrary, Paul says, if your enemy is hungry, do what? Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, that's not meant to mean that you're going to hurt him. But what it is, is you're supposed to get their sensitive heart moving or get their heart to be more sensitive. It says, do not be overcome by, by evil, but overcome by evil with good. We are to proactively show love, hence why we personally privately go to them. To do so is to fulfill all that God has required in the first commandment, right? Or the first and second commandment, to love God with all our heart and to love our neighbor as ourself. We are to just demonstrate love by swallowing our pride and to seek restoration by calling our offender to repentance. And then thirdly, as we get ready here, we're very close to the end is don't forgive the unrepentant. Again, we've said that this, this seems odd, but forgiveness is conditional on repentance. So thirdly, we don't forgive the unrepentant, but we leave room for the wrath of God. Look at Romans 12, verse 19. Paul says, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, in our example for 1 Samuel, David learned that lesson. And Abigail saved David from doing a great injustice. For God is the one who will judge all things. And so many times, you and I may just have to do our best, seek reconciliation, seek restoration, but if they refuse then we need to leave it to the hand of God. For God will bring all things into balance. Paul himself writes this exhortation from experience. As we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he cautions his son Timothy, his spiritual son Timothy, he says, now listen, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. 
The Lord, though, will repay him according to his deeds. But beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. So there are people that you may need to mark and avoid. Now, you can't do that uh, to your spouse. Uh, You cannot do that to your children. But there may be people in your life that continually do so, that do will not repent, that you may have to remove yourself, or you may have to limit Or you may have to continually pray for them that their heart may be uh, softened. Now, as we conclude today's sermon, we must understand that we cannot control the heart attitudes of others. We cannot. But we can control ours. Having a right biblical perspective is right and important. Whether you're the offender or the offended, we must search Scripture for that. Love your offender. Pray for them. If you're the offender today, then repent, reconcile, and restore those relationships. Next week, we're going to conclude our series with the last step in pursuing uh, restoration through forgiveness is recreation. It's understanding what in the world is recreation. Next week, we're going to do so as we close with 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, finally, all of you, Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. That's how you and I approach others. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you are called that you may attain a blessing. May God make us sufficient in Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit to do so. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed as the worship team and Randy makes their way up, As usual, I want you to take a moment to pause and consider what I've shared here today. Are you the offended or are you the offender? In each case, you have a role to play. One might be to offer forgiveness. The other is to repent. For those who say, how do I do so? The first step again, take the first move. They don't listen, take someone else with you. It doesn't take it to your elders, take it to your church. In all cases, the desire is to love them and to save their soul from hell, for God's glory and their good in our, ourselves. Would you pray and respond that the Spirit may this week not allow you to lose the, 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 the tenor of this message, but they may He call you either to repentance or forgiveness in your own relationships. Randy, would you come and close us with a word of prayer? We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.